After enjoying an accomplished leadership career in the defense and technology sectors, Janet Mason is now a well-known and highly respected organizer and volunteer. Whoops, I'm sorry. There we go. Uh, volunteer in the environmental sector in Ottawa. She is co-founder and chair of Friends of the Carp River, as well as chair of the Ottawa Stewardship Council. She is a recipient of the Mayor's City Builder Award. I am confident her knowledge and passion will remind all of us why we should care about Canada's environment. Welcome, Janet. So good evening to everyone. My name is Janet, and uh, this lovely picture in the background is Shirley's Brook, which runs through Trillium Woods. And it's less than a 10-minute walk from Innovation Drive. And I have seen so many people taking business walks, like two people just chatting, and you can hear them as they go by, walking by Shirley's Brook in the middle of the day. And that's the value of the green space in Canada. So I'm here representing a couple of organizations tonight, Ottawa Stewardship Council and the Friends of the Carp River. Um, and I have two takeaways for you. One is that green space has value in multiple ways, both to the environment and to humans. And that maintaining a connected network of woods and waterways matters to the function of the plant, animal, and human communities. So we'll see if this works. Oh, it does. All right. Fabulous. So the green space has value. Uh, this is a map of Canada North, and uh, the items circled in red are the major green space areas, but actually there are many smaller green space pieces that connect even throughout the neighborhood. So there's actually this mesh network of, of connected green space in, in Canada North. And we define green space in two ways. It's natural areas like South March Highlands or Trillium Woods, and it can also be human engineered natural areas, which includes stormwater ponds, uh, golf courses, and hydro corridors. And if Steve Nichols were here tonight, I'd give a shout out to Steve on that, because we're working with him on that corridor. Um, and green space performs multiple functions. So we have the conservation function, and probably a lot of you knew I was gonna talk about that, and that's the biodiversity element, um, provides resilience to pests, diseases, and climate change. And uh, I will say, as I have walked so all of these trails, all of these areas in Canada, multiple times, um, the biodiversity in these, in these green spaces is quite high. We also have the ecosystem services that are provided. And I've only mentioned a few. The managing the stormwater runoff is extremely important. And I understand this could be an issue with the new development, should it, should it go into the golf course. Um, it buffers climate change um, related to drought and flood mitigation, and of course it sequesters carbon, so we know about those. But it also supports human well-being, and we mentioned that. Um, the recreation aspect, the connections to nature, um, the ability to engage in education and stewardship on the land often gives people a lot of satisfaction. And having run many tree plantings, people love just the connection to the earth and to the plants. And finally, it provides quality of life. And I think you'll see this in the tech sector is how many people want to live out in Canada North because of the green space and the, and the richness of the connections here, the places that they want to raise a family. All right, so the green space has value. And remember, the second message is that the network matters. And we're talking about the woods and waterway web. That's the WWW. And network engineers will certainly understand that there is resilience in this connectivity. And it's true for life as well. And islands of green space that are not connected to each other, they do not function optimally. And uh, it they, they cuts off plant movement, seed movement, animal movement, um, and it threatens the biodiversity. But we also have the human connectivity element. And here we're going to talk about, this is my amazing animation. So here's your Arcadia down there at the bottom. We have the sort of larger Kanata Lakes area. We have the Morgan's Grant area. And I'm even going to throw in Kanata South, which is a little bit of a stretch, but I'm going to throw that in there. And this whole green space network connects all of these different communities. And I will say that uh, as someone 
who has uh, walked all these areas, I, I will never bike on a major roadway, ever. But I will absolutely bike or walk or bike all the network of green space I could easily get from Arcadia um, across to um, from the, this is the shopping and the, and the working areas. I can go from Arcadia all the way through there, through up through the Trillium, sorry, up through the uh, Kizzle Wetlands uh, new trail, or we can get across, go across this way to the Kanata Golf Course. There are multiple inputs into the golf course network. You could even cross from Kanata South across the pedestrian bridge, the Marianne Wilkinson Bridge, um, and uh, get there. And you can come in from the Morgan's Grant area. And all of this is possible on green space or on, fair, on short distances on quiet streets. And I think that that's a lot more attractive. That, that type of commuting to work is a lot more attractive than trying to um, bike down a busy road. And, it's, uh, and I think there's a lot more people who will then engage in that sort of thing if, if, because it is a safer way to do it. And um, I guess uh, in closing, what I want to say is that the golf course, if you look, right, is right at the center of this, uh, of this network of green. And it's there for the ecosystem community, ecosystem connectivity, and the, and the human connectivity elements. So green space has value, and the network matters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Janet. Um, our next speaker is Neil Thompson. Neil has enjoyed a lengthy tech career across a number of companies here in Canada North Tech Park and is also a longtime resident of Beaverbrook. He is the president of the Canada North, of, excuse me, of the Canada Beaverbrook Community Association and also serves on the board of the KGPC. Neil will alert us to the risk of Canada's open and green spaces and what we need to do to protect them. Welcome, Neil. All right, so uh, in a contrast and, and support of what uh, Janet has just talked about, I'm going to talk about the planning and legal issues and funding because this is, you know, protecting green space takes time and people and money. The goal of this presentation is to give members of the KNBA an understanding of the current state of green space and the challenges ahead. In Ontario, who owns the land, what legal obligations are associated with the land, and how development is governed by the Ontario Provincial Planning Policy Statement and Ottawa Official Plan are key to understanding the future of Canada North Green Space. Here we are looking at a satellite view of Canada North courtesy of Google Earth from the fall of 2008. I picked this one because you can see where all the trees are because of all the fall colors. So let's uh, fast forward here to 2021, and you see there's a whole chunk of trees in the middle that went away. Now, that was a deliberate decision by the city, which was to uh, put development there, which is known as the KNL lands. But as you can see, it took away some green space. Now, I'll get to how the city replaced that in a couple of minutes. So let's, let's give you an orientation in terms of that this is all taken from the maps. Um, the tech parks in orange is, is the centrum, which is the commercial. The existing communities as built are in white and the current, uh, current and future development uh, are in yellow. So those are things, things to come. So this, this is all the green space and that's quite a bit of it. Now, what is, is key here is that, you know, it's rich in forests, woodlands, wetlands, waterways, wildlife. <clears throat> the issue is who controls it and what their future intentions are. The center of this and the center of Clublink's application is the 40% agreement. Barbara's already done a good introduction, but what I think from a pictorial standpoint, this gives you an idea of exactly where that sits. The golf course, which most people don't realize and which seems to be difficult for the rest of the city of Ottawa to understand, is the golf course is the section in the bottom right hand. That's less than 30% of the 40% agreement lands. The problem is if the 40% agreement goes, so do they. Trillium Woods will become a stormwater management platform. 
The city owns some parcels of land in here, and one of the things that was done in 2006 was the city bought what is the South March uh, Conservation Area uh, Forest, which is the large section in blue on the left. There's other parcels that were done on some trade-offs that are above where the, uh, what is Trillium Woods, and there's also the Biltaran Park, which is just squeezed in between the golf course and Central. Turns out, if you look at the City of Ottawa's GMAP application, there's also a lot of lands that are marked as environmentally protected or they're marked as open space. So that's all the areas in light green that is uh, with, with the red outline. This green space, the ones in red, is green space in the hands of private owners that are zoned, as I said, as environmentally protected or open. However, these lands are not protected by provincial or environmental legislation, nor through legal contracts. The problem with zoning is that landowners can apply to change zoning on any property at any time. Doesn't mean it will be granted, but they can make the application. Here we can see that in addition to Clublink owning the Canada Golf Course, Minto owns the Trillium Woods. They own that property. And the KNL developers jointly own the area immediately north of the Beaver Pond. Now, Minto and the developers were supposed to have turned that land over to the city already, but they have not. It is speculation that they are hoping the 40% agreement will ultimately fall into the courts, which would allow them to apply to develop it. Hence the situation we have right now. The key takeaway is we have lots of green space. The problem is we don't necessarily control it. And it's subject to rezoning, it's subject to legislation, and the only way to do that, uh, to defend it, requires, you know, Canada North residents and businesses organize and invest time and funding to fight developers like Clublink and ensure that urban development respects green space. This includes working through the courts and the provincial planning process through working with the City of Ottawa and lobbying at Queen's Park. So, as everybody in the room knows here in the tech park, uh, talent makes things work. So, part of what the KBCA learned a number of years ago is to play the game of, you know, getting things approved or not approved or changing minds around what gets developed and where, you need to know how to play the game. And the claim, quite frankly, is you need a very strong professional team that have the experts that get noticed in front of the court and get noticed at City Hall. That includes um, the top legal, urban planning, and engineering experts. Legally, we need municipal law experts. That was very relevant during the Ottawa Land Tribunal hearings. We've got two of our lawyers here who are a fabulous litigation team that are, have been representing the KGPCA, the KGPC and, and the community in the court cases related to the 40%. That's still an ongoing fight, plus a new restrictive covenant court case. Technical, uh, you must have an urban planner, and we're blessed actually to have probably one of the top urban planners in Canada, Dennis Jacobs, who is one of the few urban planners of his caliber available to community and community associations on the defense side, because most of the urban planners work for the city or the developers. In addition, there's a lot of engineering issues uh, that are very critical. Um, stormwater management and contamination has been brought up time and again. And again, these people are very hard to find because their livelihood is predominantly working for developers. So we're very lucky to have found these people. Barbara worked, I don't know what, about a year, year and a half to try and find some of these people. And we've actually been very lucky to do so. But protecting green space takes money. We've been at it three and a half years, December 18th, 2018. I'm sitting down to dinner on a Friday night and I get a phone call. Clublink would like to meet with you and the head of the Canada Lakes Community Association to talk about the golf course. That's when it started and I've been involved in it ever since. Costs for the KGPC since then have run 150 to $250,000 a year, paying for the legal experts and the engineering and the urban planners engaging you know, in, in you know, the court cases, uh, applying you know, in front of the city for the development applications at the OLT. This is not a cheap business. 
It's not super insanely expensive, but it, for communities to do this, that's, that's fairly substantial. This will continue for years. This is not over yet. Give you a case in point. Oakville with Club Link and Glen Abbey, it was seven years that they were ongoing, and the only reason it stopped is because Queen Park stepped in and convinced Club Link to go away. Why, we officially don't know. Again, to look at that, um, where did the donations, how have we been funding ourselves so far? Funding to Nate has been predominantly through community individuals and families, where they're donating somewhere between 50 and a couple of thousand bucks across multiple funding asks and funding events. So we're here today, and I've been appointed to do the ask that the KN BA member organization also consider helping fund the green space protection. A key challenge to green space legal and planning issues is the need for funds can change at a, at a, at a moment's notice. Club Link is forever playing games trying to financially exhaust the community and the city. The city, I believe, has spent a uh, million dollars so far in defending this. So, you know, relying on fundraising events is both time consuming and risks not having the right funds at the right time. So we have opportunity issues where if we have the money to spend the professionals, we can do so. If we don't have the money at the time, we may, may list a legal or other opportunity. So we're asking the KNTP and KNBA members to look at potentially providing up to 50% of the KGPC funding of about a, uh, half of our needs, which is $125,000 a year. And the idea would be if we could plan on that and budget it and have it ready so when we have contingency problems that we can address those. This provides for not only the club link issues, but we're obviously going to have issues going forward. This is a long-term game, right? We're three and a half years into it. There's development that's coming up uh, all the time. There's a huge pressure. We've already got, I think I counted, 12,000 housing units are already on the books for Canada North. That's a growth of 25,000 people in a community of 36,000 people. That's on the books. All the land that's been assigned for that is not you know, been completely rolled out, it's got to go somewhere. The green space is going to be a wonderful opportunity if, for, for developers if the community is not prepared to stand up and ask for it. In addition, one of the things I talked to, and I, I was talking to Steve Willis about this, the person who was probably most instrumental in helping the city buy the uh, South March Conservation Forest was Nick, Nick Stowe. And I was talking to him a couple of days ago, and I said, Nick, tell me about green space stewardship. And he says, we're doing as much as we can, but you know, budgets are tight. And manpower and doing this stuff is, is, is a big part of that. So one of the things I said, okay, so how could we help? And is basically is that we need to leverage the experts we've got. We'll leverage the city expertise. We, the KBCA has been running a, a tree inventory program where we brought somebody in from the University of Toronto who runs a program called Neighborwoods. And we've been diligent working with other community associations across the city. And we're doing inventory to find out what's the health of our trees, what's the health of our canopy. So a key thing here is to leverage the city staff and other professionals with community volunteers and students. And that would include not only looking at areas like the stormwater management areas, uh, beaver pond and everything else, this is also about in your community. What should you be planning to help on your own property? What should be, what areas of, of all the trailways, et cetera? What can we all be doing? And, do, and even in the Canada North Tech Park, should we be greening up the tech park? So the estimate there is that we could do something significant with a steady budget of about 15,000 bucks a year. This would be for students' salaries, training, materials, equipment. For example, invasive species are rampant and the city doesn't have the budget to get rid of them. Students are happy to do it, but you need, you need the clothing, you need the protective gear, you need to get trained on how to do this, because some of that stuff is really nasty. So we've got the bodies, but we need to get the organization and steadiness of funding would help us do that. And you know, that's, 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 that's a great opportunity. So, thank you for the time. I hope this has uh, given you some more insight. And just leave it. The green space we have is worth protecting. It's world class. There's lots of it. But protecting is hard work.
And, you know, we need people and we need funding. Thank you.